First Peter chapter 3 is where we are, and down near the back of your Bible is First Peter. First Peter chapter 3, and what I want to start with this morning is uh, us reading the, the context here, and then we will focus in this morning on verses 15 and 16, but uh, want us to get a, a breadth of where we're heading and so this makes sense for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 is where we'll start. Oh, that was, that was great to worship. It's great to sing. Um, I love that new song. Uh, I'm enough in Christ. Uh, uh, that is an important, important message. Uh, today, especially for moms, right? Uh, a little side note as you're turning to First Peter chapter 3. Um, there's so much pressure for moms today uh, to be all this, right? And uh, in Christ, in Christ, you are enough. Uh, in Christ, he is enough for you. And so we're going to find our rest. We're going to find our strength in him. And uh, that's good. Well, here we are, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 8, and let me read through here so we have, a, again, the context, know where we're heading, and then, uh, and then we'll dive into verses 15 and 16. Here's what it says. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. Since you were called for this, so that you may inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Uh, let, me, let me pray for us. Father, as we go to your word, and uh, again, as we, as we want to understand what you are saying, oh, Lord, teach us, help us, Lord, help us to hear, help us to understand, and, and be changed because we've spent time in your word, hearing from you. So we, we give you this time, and we ask for you to lead us and guide us, and, and it's in your name that I ask, in the power of your name, by the work of your spirit. Amen. Well, we certainly live in shifting times, uh, cultural times. Uh, if you are a Christian, uh, things are, uh, the, the nation, maybe the, even the world is shifting, right? There is, there's this shift that is going on, the, the sands uh, of the day are, are, are shifting, and to be a Christian is going to be just a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult. Um, if you're a Christian, you are uh, more and more on the outs, and if you are secular, uh, more and more on the in. And so it's a, it's a shifting time for us as, as believers. Uh, a recent Gallup po po uh, poll that I had read uh, showed a fairly significant decline in church membership in churches in the last two decades. Uh, church membership was declining, and 
the, the nuns, not the nuns, but the nuns, uh, claiming no particular religious faith is the fastest growing, uh, would you call it religion, uh, of the day? Um, everybody believes something, uh, but that's the fastest growing population. We're watching our culture shift, uh, being, being less Christian. We're not a, a Christian nation, right? Uh, what was, just even just a few years ago, well accepted, well received of being a, a uh, Christ follower, of, of believing in Christ and the teachings of the Bible, of God's word, uh, you would now be, um, potentially you would now be seen as uh, outdated, bigoted, racist, homophobic, Lots of, lots of things, right? Uh, we, we're on the, we'll be part of the council culture. <laughs> um, uh, lawsuits, if the Equality Act goes through, lots of changes for believers uh, of what we say is true. Uh, even in the Christian community, I, I see lots of shifts going on. Uh, questions. Uh, that have not been questions for the last 2,000 plus years over sexuality, over gender, over uh, lots, of, lots of schisms that are going on in the church. The, the lines are, seem to be fading. And um, maybe more and more of a, of a distancing from, from God's word in, in many ways. Uh, because if you do hold to what God's word says, there... Uh, there's challenges that come with that. And so we see even churches that are succumbing to the culture uh, bent. Uh, in many ways, Christians have got so caught up in politics that, uh, well, this is what God would say, and this is the right. Uh, perhaps we're, we're losing our voice. Um, my, my aim is not to bemoan culture, but, but rather uh, to recognize where we live today and say, well, the Lord has planted us here now, so how do we live? And we are not the first culture that is in a shift where things are becoming more difficult if you're going to be a Christ follower. That's, that's nothing new. In fact, that's been more the ordinary. We as a nation have just uh, uh, experienced the uh, predominant blessings of being in the in the flow for uh, the last uh, couple hundred years. That's shifting, more secular, uh, and uh, there. Uh, th this is this has been normal across history. Peter is writing to believers who are are living with Christ in the center of their lives. Uh, when, when they've believed in Christ, it's changed their life, and that has brought a lot of suffering. We're going to see that all the more in the coming weeks. How do you suffer uh, when Christ is in the center? How do you suffer for the glory of God? How do you uh, endure? How do you go through suffering uh, being a, a Christ follower? Many times we're going to see that all the more in chapters 4 and 5 of First Peter. We, we live in a growingly dark world, but God has planted us here now, and what does that mean for us to shine for him? Uh, just, just recently, uh, last month, I uh, was camping up in northern Zion with uh, four other guys, and, uh, and as the sun goes down, uh, and the stars start to come out, uh, all the more as we sit out there, the darker it would get, the, the more and more stars you would see. And it just, it just became just glorious of seeing all of the stars uh, that were going on. The darker it got, the more stars you would see. And so I just have to wonder, the darker that it gets, if it's going to shine all the more for believers who are Christ followers. I just wonder if we're going to sparkle just a little bit more, the darker it gets. Uh, God has planted us here now, and so how do we live for him? 
What does it look like to live for Him, for God's grace to shine brighter in us? Christ is the believer's hope. If you're a Christ follower, your hope is in Jesus Christ. He is your hope. No, no matter what happens around you, He's your hope. And so, how, how do we live in a culture that is increasingly becoming darker? How, how do we worship in that? Uh, just this week, in going through the Bible reading plan, I was in Acts 16, and I was reminded, looking at, uh, at Paul and Silas, who were put in prison in, in the town of Philippi, they were beaten for, uh, for proclaiming Christ, and they were put in prison. They are they're chained, they're in jail, and you know what they do? They worship. They're, they're singing. How do you have that kind of response in the middle of after being beaten and, and then put in jail to worship? How, how, how does that happen? Let me give you a little insight. Their hope was in Christ. Their hope was in God. That's where their hope is found. Christians, our hope needs to be in Christ. That, that needs to be our drive. And, and so we'll, we'll see this all the more as we continue on in our study. But this morning, I want us to focus down in verses 15 and 16 primarily because it is about how do you make Christ known? How do you let him shine in your life that, that others around you will see that he is your hope uh, and that, that, that he is the center of your life? So that's where we want to focus. And, and two primary things that we want us to see out of out of these that I, that I hope we'll walk away with is, is one, that, that Christians should be known, what, what they should be known for is that their hope is in Christ. That's what Christians should be known for. Their hope is in Christ. And two, I believe verse 16 is going to be drawing out for us, well, how do we do that? How do we live... Um, what do we do? How do we respond to the culture so that Christ shines and that, we, that they see that he really is our hope? That, that, that's the aim this morning and, and where we want to go. I started in verse 8, and 8 through 13 primarily is describing a growing Christian's character. So if you're growing in Christ, the, your character is going to be growing closer to, uh, to be more like Christ, Christian, Christ-like. Uh, you, you're going to be drawing, you're going to be coming, walking more and more with Jesus, and as you walk more with Jesus, these are the kind of things that come out in your life. And, and generally, when you walk with Jesus, things go well in your life. The, the, the closer that you are to him, the, the, the more uh, righteousness, uh, holiness, the, the, the more you walk with him, things generally go better. Um, you, um, you, you love and care for others. You have a real love and compassion for others. Uh, you become less prideful. You're, you're more humble and, uh, and, and gentle. Uh, when, you, when you walk with Jesus, you treat others kindly. You speak truthfully. There's less gossip. Uh, more, more honesty, less talk behind people's backs. Uh, you are friendlier. Uh, you, ha you have less enemies in, in many ways. That, that's, that's usually the case, the, the more you walk with Jesus. Not always, as, as Peter even is drawing out. What, what happens when it doesn't go well? You're growing in Christ. You're, you're growing in, the, in these character traits of like-minded, sympathetic, loving one another. You're compassionate, not paying back evil for evil, insult for insult. For insult. Uh, you're giving a blessing. Th these are good things. But what happens when it doesn't go well? And that's verse 13, right? Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Like, hey, things are going to generally go well for you. But even if you should suffer for righteousness... How are you going to respond? What are you going to do? 
even if, uh, even if you suffer for doing what is right, for walking with the Lord, how do you respond? What are you going to do? And so, how do you live with Jesus in the center? And the first thing there is, maybe you already looked ahead there, was you are blessed. So, verse 14. So, three quick things, and then we're going to jump into verses 15 and 16, right? So, this sets us up for 15 and 16. So, who's going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. So, you can put a number one there. First of all, you are blessed. Don't forget, you are blessed. If you suffer for righteousness, don't forget you are still blessed. You have the Lord. You are blessed. And then the, the next little part, in fact, part of a quote from Isaiah chapter 8. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. Do not fear. When the heat comes, don't crumble. When the heat comes, don't crumble. When, when you suffer for doing what is right, don't, don't crumble under that. And so, like I said, Isaiah chapter 8, uh, do not fear or, or, uh, or what they fear or be intimidated. Uh, here, here's what verses eight, uh, or chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 says in Isaiah. Do not call everything a conspiracy that they may say is a conspiracy. Well, this is relevant. This was, this was written a while ago. Um, do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. We fear the Lord. Our, our, our look, our view, our, we're watching and we look to him. So don't fear what they fear or be intimidated. And then the first part of verse 15, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy. Keep Christ in the center of your life. So suffering may come because of your your obedience to Christ, you're changing and you're, you're becoming more like Jesus in your life, suffering may very well come. So, so don't fear, don't crumble. Remember, you're still blessed. You have the Lord. And, and keep him the center of your life. Regard Christ the Lord as holy. He's yours. He's, he's in your life. This is your hope. So, with all of that as the, as the groundwork for uh, the rest of verses 15 and 16, all right, uh, we, we need to keep that in, in mind because then it says, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So you're living in a culture that is more and more secular. You're, you're living in a, in a culture that more and more wants to move away from being under any authority of God and that they are, that individuals are the final authority for their own lives. That's our culture that is growing more and more today. So how do you live? What are you going to do? D don't fear. Don't, don't crumble. Don't hide out. And, and let them shine. Let them shine. Let Christ shine in you. Here is what we should be known for. Look at, look at what he says. Ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, should be known that He is in us, that Christ has made a difference in us. We should be known for, as, as being Christ followers. Our lives look different than, than the culture around us. We should be known as people of hope. We should be known as people of hope. Of anybody in the, in, the, in the world. We should be known as people of hope. 
We, we let them shine and we share that hope that is in us. And, and he says, ready at any time. At any time. To give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. This is um, so practical, so, so good for us. At any time, ready to give an up, whenever the opportunity arises, I, I'm ready to explain the hope that is in me at any moment. I've heard, uh, been around church for a long time, I've heard many things out of this verse, and I've, I've many times felt very guilty. <laughs> uh, I felt a, a lot of shame when this comes up, and I'm like, how many times I've had opportunities to, uh, to tell of the hope that is in me, and I've, I've just not said anything. Uh, and a number of things will flash across my mind, uh, depending upon the situation. Um, I, I don't know enough. I don't, I don't have enough knowledge. I'm going to say the wrong thing. Um, I'm not sure this is a really great door. I'm going to look for a better one a little bit later. Uh, so I'm not sure this is the right one to be able to, you know, drop the Jesus bomb. And, uh, and so I, I'm never really sure. Uh, and, um, and so oftentimes I've looked at this and I just feel shame. <laughs> um, I suspect I'm probably not the only one who's come across this and felt uh, just yuck. Let's 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 move on. Uh, is is there more in First Peter we can go to? Um, any time. At any time. Uh, to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Um, certainly, maybe it needs to be said. If nobody's ever asking you, I wonder why. <laughs> um, but uh, sometimes I feel like, oh, well, this is, this is allotted for the apologists, those who are skilled and trained in making a defense for the gospel. Is that, is that alone who Peter is talking to? Well, obviously not, right? Um, he's writing to believers, Christians. If you're a Christian, he's writing to you. Does it mean you need to know everything? Does it mean you'll know everything? Absolutely not. So let's just take, take everything off the, the table here. <laughs> we trust in God. Our, our hope is in Christ. I, I don't know what to say. The Lord knows. And so you, you'll fumble your way through a whole lot. I don't know if you've ever shared Christ before and you've walked away and you're like, why didn't I say that? Or why did I say that? Or why didn't I? And you think of all the different things you could have said. You know what? Here's, uh, let me just give you a, just a, a, a quick exciting news here. God's sovereign. <laughs> and God is able to accomplish all of his purposes. You, you, you're not going to mess it up. Um, he'll, use, he'll use all these things for his glory and his good. But, but I, who is it that's going to be asking for you to give a reason for the hope that is in you? And as I've thought about this, I, I think it's because primarily, there might be a couple of stray folks out there that maybe would ask you, but, but generally, those who are going to ask you are those who are close to you. It's those who are watching you, those who are close enough to see your life. Those are the ones who will potentially be asking you for the hope that is in you. And, and by the way, that asking you, I don't know, I read this and it's kind of like, um, it seems like a very positive, very nice thing. Like, oh, can you please tell me about the hope that you have? Uh, you just live so differently. I just want to know about the hope. And it's just like, oh, wow, here's the gospel just laid right out. My, my guess is that many times that doesn't come across that way. <laughs> Uh, in fact, it may come across as, as very uh, antagonistic or a, a backhanded compliment. Uh, or it'll come in a way that, uh, oh, 
uh, when I was uh, living in uh, close quarters with all of my marine buddies on ship, uh, I was known as the Jesus freak, the Bible thumper, uh, and um, uh, there's lots of things that um, I was labeled. Uh, they, they see you live differently. And so they were not usually, uh, at least when I was in a group, I, they, they never asked me kindly, tell us, tell us, O Caprine, what gives you the hope for your life? Now, many conversations on the side that were private, they, they lean in that direction sometimes, but never publicly. They were always a, a ding. I remember we were uh, on ship and we, uh, one of the guys was like, hey, so Caprine, you got a verse for us? In my zealous, uh, unloving way, I said, I do. Unless you repent, you shall surely die. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody goes, ooh. <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't ever ask me again. Um, um, very zealous, very truthful, but not done in love. Um, I had more growing to do. <laughs> um, typically, I have not said something because of fear of man. Typically, I shut down because I'm afraid of rejection and I'm afraid of what they're going to think about me. That's typically why I don't say anything. I feel the Spirit of God who will, will prompt me and I'll, I'll be like, eh, I'm just hungry or just something else. But my guess is here, of any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, th these are people who are watching you live, and they're seeing something different, and so they are calling that out, whether publicly or privately, maybe even in the home. Uh, parent, how you live matters. Your kids will watch you and see what matters. Of anybody, your, your spouse and your kids, those in your home, see how you live. Is this the kind of thing that's growing in your life? Peter isn't just talking to trained apologists. He's talking to believers. He's talking to mothers. Your impact, your influence in your home is significant. Your kids running through your Bible and seeing all the markings in your Bible, watching you and seeing and walking in on you as you're praying. Influence. Your kids watching you, fathers, as you go and you apologize to your kids, asking them for forgiveness because you, you spoke harshly to them because you were wrong. Influence. They, they, they see your life. They, they see whether you're the real deal or not. Your, your workers. Just this week, uh, in, uh, in, in my uh, Josh's Men's small group, we finished up and there's a couple of guys that were mentioning uh, in work how uh, challenging it is to be able to share their faith because it is in a place where you're not allowed to talk about your faith. So, so how do you do it? What does that look like? And they're both sharing about when the Lord gave opportunity, they still just walk through that door. They took a risk. They listened to the Spirit of God and they, they walked through. Um, so far, they haven't been fired. <laughs> Um, praise the Lord. Your friends see you. They see you. What, what should we be known for, Christian? For the hope that is in you. 
we, we should be known as there's an assumption here that we're growing in Christ and walking more closely to him. And as we are, it should be known that, that there's something different in your life. Something else drives you is your motivator. What is not what drives us is not politics and who's in the office. Is it important? Yes. Is that what drives us? Is that where our hope is? Absolutely not. Our hope is not in whether we have guns or don't have guns. Our hope is in Christ. What we should be known for is that Jesus saves and rescues sinners like me. what I want to be known for. This is the hope that is in me. It's it's what we should be known for more than anything else. He lives differently because he knows Jesus. He he doesn't compromise because he's committed to Christ. We look different in the world around us and, and so... My guess is if nobody's asking you, it's probably because you're not living all that much differently. In fact, making Christ known probably isn't even on your radar. He's just an addition at best. But this, this is the hope that is in you. So how? How how do you... How do you make that known? There is a good way and there is a bad way to do that. Verse 16. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience. So that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. They are going to attack you, but they're going to see your life and go, uh, I don't have anything to say on this. But, but we, we should be known as people of hope, and, and we do that with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. We should be known as being people of the light. Our hope is in Christ, uh, not as being jerks. There's a lot of jerk Christians, uh, and, and that's not what we should be known for. Gentleness and respect. We know many offensive Christians. And, and, and so what makes Christians offensive? Two things. One, keeping a clear conscience. Those who compromise the truth. That is, that, that's offensive, that's offensive to God. Keeping a clear conscience. Uh, those who will compromise the truth. And, and sometimes they'll do that for the sake of love. They'll compromise in the truth. Very, very practically, uh, I, I see Christians that will compromise in what God has said in his word because it, uh, it's going to be offensive to be a Christ follower. So, so a parent who will compromise on gender or sexuality because their child has changed their gender or sexuality. So they'll all of a sudden shift and compromise what God has said. But keep a clear conscience. Be true to the truth. Be true to what you know is, was right by what God has said. We, we, don't, we don't want to compromise. And we can leave a trail of aggression and arrogance, which is the opposite, right, of gentleness and respect. You know what I hear in this? Gentleness and respect is, is a caring and a loving for others. You, you respond to, to others in gentleness, respect. You, you care for them. You love them. Uh, maybe a good word, in fact, I, I love this word. Uh, maybe what, what Peter is drawing out here is somebody who is winsome. 
You you have a winsome character. Gentleness and respect. You're winsome. When I was thinking about winsome and, uh, and, and, and Jesus shining and those with a winsome character, uh, somebody who's gentle and respectful, here are some things. I'd love to know what, what things you come up with, with somebody who uh, is shining for Jesus with a winsome personality, a winsome character. Things that I was thinking of is that they are, these are people that are thankful less complaining. They don't complain, but they're, they're thankful. They're grateful. Uh, people that, um, that watch their language. They, their language is different. And boy, I can, I can tell you, uh, your language, if there's anything that will stand out in a workplace is the fact that your language is different as a believer than the rest of the world. That will be one of the first things that stands out. Avoid gossip. One who is shining for Christ, who's winsome, who's gentle and respectful, isn't gossiping. Uh, they, uh, they will also do things like, they'll do the, the low man on the totem pole type of, of jobs. They'll jump in and they'll serve. They, they treat everyone with respect, with dignity. Everybody. Those they disagree with, respectfully. They, um, you know, one of the things you can do is you would pray for those in your workplace who don't know Christ. Even better is if you know of another believer, before you start your shift, you, you meet together and just briefly you pray. That you would, you would live out this. You'd have the opportunities. Uh, one, one of the things I would say is, is huge in being a Christ light and letting your light shine is follow up. You, 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 you actually follow up. Somebody shares something at work or one of your friends shares something that is heavy to them and you, uh, you add that into your prayer list, you pray about it, and you actually follow up. You, you actually go and you say, hey, I, I've been praying about this and I was wondering, how's that gone? What's gone on with that? You're going to make a huge statement. That isn't proselytizing. That's just being you. You follow up. I find that you do this with gentleness and respect is a, is a posture, it's a direction of having walked with Jesus. It, it, it grows as you, as you grow with Jesus. You, you, you grow in compassion toward others because you've been with Jesus. Jesus modeled this in uh, Matthew chapter 9. It says he saw the crowds, and when he saw the crowds, he felt, he felt compassion. He felt dis because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. He felt compassion for them. The more you've been with Jesus, the more compassion you will feel for others. You'll grow in your compassion. P Peter's describing somebody here who, who cares for others, who, who loves them. They, uh, they actually listen to those who they're talking to. You, you listen, you, you lean in, you ask questions, you, you're aiming to get beyond just the surface and, and find out what drives them, what, what motivates them, what, what encourages them, what, what is, uh, what's heavy in their world. You see, the one who Who's, who's been with Jesus moves, moves closer to, to people and to their heart and, and wants to get to know them and, and love them and care for them. Loving the person to tell them of the hope that is in you. It's, it's what's described here in that 
rest of that verse, right? So verse 16, yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He suffered, Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. This is the gospel. The righteous one, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who suffered so he can bring you to God, to bring you in a relationship with him. He becomes the center. And what does that mean? He becomes the center. Here's what this means. The, the closer that you get to Jesus, the more you get to know him, the more that you walk with him, you're just going to love it. You're going to love Jesus. You're going to love getting to know him all the more. You're just going to love it. He, he's great. He's He's worthy of your life. You're just going to love it. And you want others to, to know that. You want others to know the hope that is in Christ alone. That's what verses 17 and 18 is drawing out here. In fact, the rest of chapter 3. The, the, the answer is in Christ. So we, we grow in him. We, we, we tell of the hope that is in us and we do that gently, respectfully, keeping a clear conscience. We, we love others. And we, we, we let that just be lived out. A number of years ago, I came across a story of, of a man that extremely lived this out of making Christ known in the midst of suffering. The story came out uh, out of a story that Michael Card had, had told of, of a man at an evangelistic uh, conference that was put on by the Billy Graham Association uh, that... Uh, came and shared his story. He was a Maasai warrior uh, by the name of Joseph. Here's his story. One day, Joseph, who was walking along one of these hot, dirty African roads, met someone who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. Then and there, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The power of the Spirit began transforming his life. He was filled with such excitement and joy that the first thing he wanted to do was return to his, old, his own village and share that same good news with the members of his local tribe. Joseph began going from door to door, telling everyone he met about the cross of Jesus and the salvation it offered, expecting to see their faces light up the way his had. To his amazement, the villagers not only didn't care, but they became violent. The men of the village seized him and held him to the ground while the women beat him with strands of barbed wire. He was dragged from the village and left to die alone in the bush. Joseph somehow managed to crawl to a water hole. And there, after days of passing in and out of consciousness, found the strength to get up. He wondered about the hostile reception he had received from the people he had known all of his life. He decided he must have left something out of the story of Jesus, and he incorrectly told it. After rehearsing the message he had first heard, he decided to go back and share his faith once more. Joseph limped into the circle of huts and began to proclaim Jesus. He died for you so that you might find forgiveness and come to know the living God, he pleaded. Again, he was grabbed 
by the men of the village and held while the women beat him, reopening the wounds that had just begun to heal. Once more, they dragged him unconscious from the village and left him to die. To survive the first beating was truly remarkable. To live through the second, a miracle. Again, days later, Joseph awoke in the wilderness, bruised, scarred, and determined to go back. He returned to the small village, and this time they attacked him before he had a chance to open his mouth. As they flogged him for the third time and probably the last time, he again spoke to them of Jesus Christ the Lord. Before he passed out, the last thing he saw was that the women who were beating him began to weep. This time he awoke in his own bed. The ones who had so severely beaten him were now trying to save his life and nurse him back to health. The entire village had come to Christ. That's love. That's love. That is compassion. That's a picture of what Peter is drawing out. Joseph didn't have a degree in apologetics. He had compassion. He had love. He had the hope of Christ that was in him. That's what's described for us in verse 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that, the, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You, you have no way of being in relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ. You, you have no way to be in community with him apart from Jesus. Church, he has to be the center of your life. He's your hope. It's what we're known for. Without Christ, there is no salvation. Without Christ, there is an eternity in hell, not in heaven. In the Christ, the hope of Christ. If you have Jesus, if you have trusted in him, you have the hope of life. You have Jesus, so pursue him. Let him change you. Go after him and, and make him known. Let him shine. Oh, be, be changed by this loving Savior. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, and the more that he, that he changes us, oh that, oh, that we, oh, that we will tell others of the hope that is in us to his glory. Let's pray. Father, this, this is the good news. This is the news that we needed to be reminded of. We need you. Lord, for anybody who does not know you right now, I pray that they will turn to you and believe in the saving work of your Son, Jesus Christ. There may be some here who have been in church a long time but do not know you. Oh, awaken their soul. Give life. And Lord, I pray that we as 
Christ followers will be changed and transformed and we'd walk more and more closely to you because of the work of your spirit in us. Oh Lord. May we not, may we not hide and, and, but, but may we make you known May we follow you unashamedly the hope that is in us. Oh, burn, blaze hotly in us, Lord. Oh, blaze the white hot fire to you. To you be the glory. It is in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.